Welcome to this episode of the Structural Engineering Channel podcast, a podcast focused on helping structural engineering professionals stay up to date on technical trends in the field to help them succeed in their careers and lives. In this episode, we talk to Jared M. Green, PE, DGE, NOMA, who is the host of one of EMI's other podcasts, the Geotechnical Engineering Podcast. Jared is also a vice president at Langan Engineering. And in this episode, he's going to tell us what he thinks a structural engineer needs to know about geotechnical engineering. I'm your co-host, Matt Picardo. I'm a licensed engineer at DCI Engineers, practicing on structural projects in California with an undergraduate degree from Cal Poly Pomona and a master's degree in structural engineering from UC San Diego. And I'm your co-host, Alexis Clark. I work in Hilti's North American headquarters as the product manager of our chemical anchoring portfolio in the US and Canada. I'm a licensed professional engineer in Texas. I received my bachelor's in civil engineering from UT Austin and I'm currently an MBA candidate at Auburn. And now I have the privilege to introduce our guest for this episode and host of the Geotechnical Engineering Podcast, Jared Green. Jared, originally from Southwest Philadelphia, graduated from Syracuse University's College of Engineering in 2001 with a bachelor's in civil engineering. He later went on to attain his master's in civil engineering with a geotechnical focus from the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign in 2002. In 2003, he began working in New York City office of Langen. He has since become the principal or vice president and is one of the owners of this international land development engineering consulting firm. Jared enjoys mentoring young engineers. He has been instrumental in increasing the number of pre-college students that are interested in STEAM majors and fields. Now let's jump into our conversation with Jared. Jared, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for being on. Uh, thank you so much for having me. I feel kind of starstruck seeing the two of you on the other side. This is awesome. <laughs> oh, no problem. I know we I know we both got the podcast going on, so we're very excited to to have the geotechnical perspective on here. And many of yeah. our listeners already know who you are. And we gave you an intro already, but in your own words, can you tell us a little bit about what you do on a daily basis? Yeah, good question. Well, you know, honestly, I'd say that no two days are the same. <laughs> um, I'm a geotechnical practice leader and um, an, an office leader. So that means I could be doing anything from, you know, making sure that I'm checking people's timesheets or making sure that invoices are ready to go out or reviewing a proposal or meeting somebody in the field to go over samples during a, um, a soil exploration. So it's very dynamic, lots of moving pieces. Sometimes I'm interacting with my project managers, other times I'm interacting with my staff, and sometimes I'm interacting with clients or vendors or contractors. So I get to see a little bit of everything. And um, it's been organic. I mean, there was a time where I was a staff engineer and I was focused on seeing one thing at a time. And I think that over time, it just grows and grows and grows to the point where you're like, wow, how did my to-do list get so long? <laughs> But, um, you know, thrilled to be a part of, uh, you know, geotechnical engineering as, as, a, uh, as a discipline and I'm um, still having just as much fun as when I started, you know, almost 20 years ago. That's a good sign, especially as your work kind of evolves over your, over your own career. And as the daily tasks start to change, it's, it's exciting when not, no two days look the same, right? Yeah. Always yeah. keeps you on your feet. Definitely. It doesn't get boring. That's good. It's important. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, so Jared, I know we've introduced you and um, obviously our, our audience now knows that you are the Geotechnical Engineering Podcast host. Um, yeah. But for those audience members that we may have that are a little bit younger or maybe still in college and understanding the different disciplines of, of engineering, can you explain to us what is it that a geotechnical engineer does? Because sometimes it seems like this really vast field. And in your opinion, how does that differ what, from what structural engineers do? Very good question. You know, when I think about engineering in general, I'd say the engineers are problem solvers, right? We use math and science to solve problems. If somebody has a challenge, how do you figure this out? And, you know, when I think about structural engineers, a lot of times we think about what is the engineering material that we're focusing in on, right? So you have timber, you have steel, you have reinforced concrete, and perhaps some other things, precast and things of that sort. But like, when you think about geotechnical engineering, our engineering materials, like, mother earth right the thing that we're sitting on or standing on or the building we're sitting in is, is resting on right so that's soil and there's a litany of different types of soil right uh and bedrock and then there's interaction with that bedrock and that soil the actual 
foundation and then you couple in groundwater. And those are the things that the geotechnical engineer is focusing in from an engineering standpoint. And so we're solving problems that tie back to, again, because we're civil engineers, tie back to the built environment, but the built environment as it relates to how things are anchored into the planet is the way I like to say it. And, um, and that results in a lot of different types of projects. So whether it's a slope stability project and trying to figure out um, whether a slope is stable or not, whether it's um, you know very tall building or very big building and what it sits on, whether it's a shallow foundation, you, know, you excavate beyond the, the frost level and sit your foundation directly on the soil that's there. Or if you have to have a deep foundation where if you're sitting in soft material, you have to now transfer the load down to something stable. Or do you actually improve the ground with some type of ground improvement? So these are the types of things that the geotechnical engineer is thinking about. And I would say that, you know, the structural engineer and the geotechnical engineer, one of the things I, I find is very interesting as I've, you know, as I've been an engineer for some time, the geotech and the structural engineer, when a project goes well, they're working together. Like when you say, where does the geotech's work stop and start? Where does the structural engineer's project, you know, scope start and stop? People can say the foundation, but who does the foundation, right? <laughs> it's like, who determines what the foundation is sitting on? That would be the geotechnical engineer, but who determines uh, loads that are coming down on the foundation? That's the structure engineer. And what happens at the interface of where our two scopes meet? The pile is coming into the cap. What does that connection look like? I think that's where we're seeing that there's opportunity for geotechs and structural engineers to work together. So, you know, if we say we're looking at a structure, I say everything that comes out of the ground, that's what the structure engineer is typically focused in on. The things that nobody sees, that's typically the things that the, the geotechnical engineer is, is focused on, but there's a lot of overlap between the two. I mean, when I asked the structural engineer, you know, you know, what's the base shear that you're gonna need, right? It's like, you're telling me one thing and then I'm telling you what the soil can actually give you and what do we have to do to reinforce things so that they work together. So there's a lot of back and forth between the two sides. And I think that when a project is successful, we're making sure that, you know, we have a full scope covered. The worst thing you want is a scope gap where the geotech says, not my scope. And the structure engineer says, it's not my scope. It's like, well, somebody has to figure that out. So I think that the more we understand about what one another is doing, uh, especially for the younger listeners, that the better we'll be able to serve you know, our, our clients and our, and, and our communities that we're working in. I love that sentiment. And I'm so glad that you brought that right from the, from the get-go, because I'm sure we have a lot of structural engineers listening who are used to listening to our, our content. And most of our guests are structural engineers. And I'm sure okay. they're thinking like, why do we have this guy on here? Like, obviously he's really smart and very impressive, but you know, why, why is he here? And that's exactly what we're here to talk about is there, there are ways that we can be better partners with one another on projects that we work on. And, and I'm so glad that you bring that up, that it's better to be collaborative and have a little bit of overlap yeah. and make sure that we're not necessarily duplicating efforts, but making sure that the both parties that have some, some stake on, on what this substructure foundation looks like, um, making sure that both parties are accounted for and that they're their perspectives are considered in design rather than everyone kind of standing back and being like, Oh no, that's their, that's their realm. So I appreciate that sentiment. Awesome. awesome. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I know from my experience when the geotech and structural engineers don't uh, work together or communicate well, then at the end of the day, I think the, the contractor, the owner is going to pay for it or someone's going to pay for it uh, versus when they are working together, uh, you know, they talk to each other on the phone about, hey, here's why, here's our, is the bearing pressure, can it be reduced or why is it that high or are there things that we can do to maybe decrease the pile lengths or maybe like, like you were saying, maybe what if we strengthen the soil or whatnot, things that uh, uh, when we're talking to each other, then it could really help benefit the, the end user, the owner, the, the people that are using the, the building, because sometimes it is just a communication. It's yeah. Like sometimes it's kind of just like, oh, well, no, we could we could do a spread foundation instead of a, a pile foundation, but you might have to do X amount of fill or do this remediation and maybe we get the contractor on board, then it could just really open up, up doors to really uh, being the most efficient design. I mean, I think at the end of the day, that's what we want to do. Uh, get a good design and yeah, the geotech, the structural engineer, but also the contractor and all the, the team players involved. Yeah, so important. I, I did want to ask about. Oh, <laughs> go ahead, Jared. No, I was going to say, I think a lot of it is just 
making sure that we understand what you need and you understand what we need. I think that that's like so crucial, so crucial. Yeah, because sometimes it's, I know uh, it goes both ways, right? Like maybe, hey, why is this pile so big or why is this foundation so big? Is there anything that we can do to uh, decrease that? Maybe just might be maybe taking another look at the sole properties or why the sole properties are like that or the things that we can do. And yeah, maybe it's just that small little conversation that could save and make yeah. the design a lot more efficient. Uh, yeah. I wanted to ask about the, like with civil engineering, it's, it's so incredibly broad and I'm sure you get this question a lot too. Uh, you know, there's different uh, parts like structural geotech, but just in terms of structural and geotech, I get a lot of questions from students and young engineers that are having trouble finding, like kind of choosing between the two. And I was actually one of those, and I'll, I'll I'll get I'll get to my story later on how I chose. But uh, in your own words, how, do you have any advice for structural or geotechnical engineers that are trying to choose between uh, geotech or structural? You know, it's it's tricky. You know, it's like we spend so much time asking young people, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up? And it's like I don't know, right? It's how do I make this decision? And then. You know, when you study something like civil engineering, you're exposed to so many different, uh, you know, subsets of civil engineering. And then you get to your senior design, and I'm focusing in on, you know, the U.S. Um, system. And a lot of times you really don't have a lot of exposure before you have to make that decision. Like you're in your capstone design class, you've taken, you know, one or two geotech classes, design class after you took your um, you know, strength and materials, statics, dynamics, and then maybe you took a, um, you know, reinforced concrete design class. So you got just a sprinkling of these things. And it's like, well, what do you focus in on? And, you know, I, I speak to a lot of geotechs, of course, through the podcast, and a lot of folks are really between geo and structural before they make up their minds. So it's kind of like, we're, we're between these two. And now what do I do now? And I would say, try to think about the types of things that you'll be doing. So we could, what does that mean? We could say, uh, do you like heights? You know, what's your relationship with heights? And somebody says, ah, I love heights. It doesn't bother me. And I say, okay, well, you know, structural engineering might be something you think about because, you know, there are going to be times you have to go up into the hoist and see what it is that you're responsible for designing, right? If somebody, oh, I don't want to do that. Okay, well, what's your relationship to, you know, getting money? You know, <laughs> as a geotechnical engineer, oftentimes you're going to come home covered with just, you know, People will say dirt. I'll say soil or mud, right? You're going to be on construction sites and, you know, freezing cold and the hot sun. And the same thing for a structural engineer, but you're like, you're, you're in the soil, right? <laughs> what relationship with that? If somebody says, I'm, I'm thrilled, that's something that's exciting to me, then, you know, maybe you go that route. But, you know, it's tough to say, you know, when you're a geotechnical engineer, you're going to work on a lot of different things. And again, it comes back to what is your engineering material, right? Soil is a particulate matter. So grains of sand, right? With perhaps some cohesion, depending on what type of soil is present, but it's like weathered down rock. That That's that's what you're using for your engineering material. For some people, they would say, you know what, there's, I don't want to do that. That just seems like it's going to be too crazy to try to figure that out from an engineering standpoint. Somebody might say, you know, it seems pretty exciting to to try to figure out you know, how do we design with soil as our engineering material? So, you know, I think that what I would tell people is try to talk to people that are in the field, see what their typical day looks like, see what uh, types of projects they work on and, and what aspects they focused in on. And that'll help you to kind of make your decision. But if you can shadow an engineer, that's like priceless. If you can do an internship or a co-op, because then you can see, I, I can imagine with instruction engineering, there's a lot of different things you can focus on, whether it's, you know, uh, just the design or a specific type of analysis. And there's a litany of things that fall under structural engineering and like matter with geotechnical, you could be somebody that's solely in the field and that you could have a career doing that. Or you could take the route of doing, uh, you know, more technical approach of doing calculations, or you could do just modeling, just modeling by itself, soil structure interaction. There's so many different things you could do. And I would say that the first thing is, you know, do you go geo or do you go structural? And again, civil engineering has more things, but we're focused on geo and structural. So, and I think that when you're thinking, you know, don't want to focus on what comes out of the ground or want to focus on what goes on down below. I think that's the first thing that you kind of have to, to flesh out. And then, you know, once you figure that out, then you start your career. And the good thing about what we're, again, we're focusing in as, as an engineering consultant, one of the things is that 
you work on several different types of projects uh, early on in your career. And hopefully you get to the point where you've seen, you know, the start or the pre-start, pre-schematic all the way through to end of construction to get an idea of how our project comes to fruition and what those stages look like gives you more of an appreciation the next time you see it. So I think that, um, I think that um, if you choose geotech or if you choose structural, because there's so much overlap between the two, it's like super important to have an appreciation of what the other side is doing. And I shouldn't say other side, what the other discipline is doing. So, you know, whether you're in school, you know, if you're taking classes, don't just take classes for just geotech, you know, take some structural classes and vice versa. And I think that as you start to um, go through this, and another thing to take into consideration when you're trying to make that decision is which one comes naturally to you? You know, sometimes some people will do structural engineering and say, getting to a point where it just, I, I don't get it. I don't get it. Oh, but geotech makes more sense to me and vice versa. Oh, I'm doing geotech. I don't get it, but structural makes more sense to me. It, for me, I was between geo and structural when I was finishing up uh, when, I, when I was an undergrad and it was time for capstone design. And I said, do I want to focus in on the structural portion of the geotech portion? And I, I picked the geotech portion. I fell in love with it. I was like, yeah, this is great. So when it was time for grad school, I said, I'm going to focus in on uh, getting a master's in geotech, but I still took uh, a number of structural engineering classes because, you know, one of my mentors told me to do it. And that's why I'm sharing it with the listeners here. So, um, yeah, I would say try different things. And the one that makes more sense to you, go in that direction. <laughs> I think that I think that'll be my final answer there. But uh, good question. Not an easy one. <laughs> yeah, that was uh, I went through a similar journey too. I think near the end, I was still uh, deciding between geotech and structural you know, near my final, my, my final years. And, uh, and like what you said, uh, obviously try to get internships. I wasn't able to get internships uh, that early, but I did have friends that had internships at both. And it, I could really get a sense of what the industry is really like, because it's obviously not exactly what it's going to be, what you're learning in school. But yeah, my turning point was like what you said, what comes naturally a little more. And yeah, one of my professors, we were doing a type of senior project and you know he, he simplified the structures enough for me to where it clicked for me i had that nice. moment where it was like oh this structure is so complicated uh and then he kind of showed me like hey stop freaking out i know it's a complicated <laughs> structure but look hey here's a bridge it's a mm -hmm. it's a continuous beam and you can even see like the bridge the way bridges are designed they're they're basically following the, the moment diagram and when he wow. simplified things like that for me that's when it was like Oh, this is really cool, and then awesome. that's how I ended up uh, getting into um, my my senior project. But uh, yeah, geotech was really interesting too. Even during my masters, I try to take as many geotech classes as possible because it is it is really important. There's going to be overlap all the time, so <laughs> if you're deciding, definitely take both classes. <laughs> yeah. uh, I'm I'm just incredibly impressed because geotech was by far my worst <laughs> class. Like, please, Lord, I will never design anything ever. <laughs> Design a foundation. Just let me get through this class. Uh, kind awesome. of, kind of struggling, and I'll, I'll be the first to admit it. Wasn't my strength, but I find it. I find it incredibly fascinating. Yeah. Um, I, I also think it's so funny. You kind of mentioned this, like comfortability. Like, do you want to be muddy or do you want to be in in high places? And I, I always kind of make jokes that there are within structural engineering, there are concrete people and there are steel people, and it depends on what level of uncertainty, flexibility, precision, or accuracy you like to have. Like steel can be pretty streamlined. You're working with, you know, ASI tables, or ASC tables. Uh -huh. um, it's a little bit more, you've got a little bit more control within that that realm. And it's a little bit more, you know, I like to think it's kind of the rogues who are like, yeah, I like the fact that I can play with the mix and I can do crazy things with it. And I feel like on this sliding scale, soils is on the other side, like where concrete is kind of the fulcrum. And soils is like, you're just going to walk to the job site and deal with it, whatever you get today. And, <laughs> and it takes, it takes someone with like true courage to deal with that amount of uncertainty, especially within engineering, because we yeah. like to know what are the assumptions? What are the factors? What are, what is it? I like a clean, nice problem set. And yep. with geotech, you don't get that. <laughs> and, and, you know, one can say that it's almost like we're, you know, we're not working with a lot of information. It's like, you know, if we go to a project and we're drilling a boring, I don't know, one every 10,000 square foot or one every 2,500 square, square foot, the boring's this diameter, right? We're not getting a lot of information and we have to figure out well, what happens in between and we have to help 
provide you information to design a foundation. It's like, we haven't drilled a lot. It's not till we're getting to the mass excavation. We're like, oh, that's where things are, right? <laughs> and and it, it's, uh, it, it's really asking for a lot from the engineer. So I like that. I'm seeing it with the fulcrum. I'm, I'm seeing it. So soils is all the way over there way somewhere. There. Way oh out there. Oh my goodness. Well, we, we just a little bit of a, like a structural to a geotech appreciation moment. I appreciate yes. the work that you do and the amount of, of ambiguity <laughs> that you somehow throw a lasso around and harness to the ground. I don't know how you do it. It's amazing. And, and I, I even, appreciate what you all are doing because I, I'm <laughs> counting on you. And I say, what are these loads? I'm not doing a load takedown. What are the loads? You know, <laughs> what governs here? Does lateral govern? Does wind govern? I mean, so we need each other. We need each other in this. <laughs> we absolutely do. We absolutely do. Uh, so Jared, when I, when I kind of look through your, your bio and your background, I understand, obviously you have a civil undergraduate degree, like most people who tend to be either a geotech or a structural, but you took those two classes in your senior year. And before you took your capstone, you decided geotech was the way you were leaning. I'm curious for someone who maybe leaned geotech in undergrad and then maybe considers doing a structural master's or vice versa, mm -hmm. how feasible do you think it is to make that switch? Well, I think it's very doable. It's very doable. I mean, I went to um, uh, I went to Syracuse for undergrad, and then you know, so I took the geotech classes, took some structural classes. But when I went to Illinois for my master's, like the and I said I was doing a geotech master's, the first class I had to take was the soil mechanics class. I was like, well, I took soil mechanics here, but it's like you're taking soil mechanics here at University of Illinois. And once I took the class, uh, taught by Professor Golem Reza Mesri, I was like oh yeah, why wouldn't I not take this class if he's teaching, right? So I think that, you know, if you're a structural and you're going the route of geotechnical, you know, what most master's programs, I don't want to say it's in school, but you're probably looking at nine to 12-ish classes, depending on uh, what the units or credits or however it's based. So you have enough time to take those classes that you may not have taken before. So if you're a geotech that's now going in the structures for a master's, I would hope that you've taken some structural classes. I mean, you don't want to just walk into a reinforced concrete design class at the graduate level and you've never taken a concrete class. I mean, that could be um, very difficult to say the very least. But um, I think that with the way the curriculum is is set with like ABET accredited college and universities, I think that the way it's set up is that you're getting enough information that when you're ready to go to work or you're ready to go to graduate school, you have not the prerequisites, but you have beyond the prerequisites to be able to handle the student, you know, workload. So I would say that if you're geotech going into structures and that's what you want to do, go for it. I think if you're a structural going into geotech and that's what you want to do, go for it. I know people that have gone both ways and they've been very successful. And I know some people have done that and then they have to choose one to do their PhD. I've seen that happen. And I've seen it where, you know, or somebody does one and the other, and then they start to work. It's, it's not necessarily that you have to choose what you're going to focus on, but you have to choose what type of firm you're going to look for, right? Because um, you can be a geostructural engineer, but what, where are you going to work, right? So you have to kind of, unless you're starting your own company, you have to kind of figure out well, which one is really like your primary and what's your secondary. I think there's, it's almost like you have to choose. You have the two loves, but you have to choose which one you, you really want to have as your primary. And I would say that, um, I mean, personally for myself, I, when I went to graduate school, my focus was geotechnical, but I said, I still want to take some structural engineering classes. So I did. I said, I still want to take some, uh, you know, like engineering, not engineering management, but like construction management, took a construction management class. And I said, I also want to make sure I take geology classes. So as geotechnical engineers, a lot of times, you know, a lot of times we, we don't realize it, but we really need to take a geology class as well to have a better understanding and better appreciation for what our engineering material is. Again, our engineering material doesn't come with like, you know, a mill certificate, you know, it doesn't come with that. So we have to, you know, understand what we're dealing with. And that can vary depending on where you are in the U.S. or where you are around the world, from a geological standpoint. So uh, so short answer is yes, you can, you can go from one to the other. I, I would be... Um, I, I would, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't have any problem with that. I think you can go one or the other because again, unless you're in some type of, I don't know, specialized curriculum where you took a lot of classes and for whatever reason, didn't get to take some of the basic things. I don't know how that would happen, but perhaps it could. Maybe you're a mechanical engineer that then says you want to be a structural engineer. And then you say, you want to be a ge geotech. Then you could say, well, I never had an introduction to geotech class. And it's like, never, it's like, never, you know? So maybe that's, something that could happen. 
Uh, I'm thinking about a, uh, a student I know now, and um, she had a background where she didn't take any, I think she took one, ge she didn't take any geotech classes. I think she had like a geotech uh, summer internship or something like that. And she had like an engineering degree. She started working and then she went back to get her geotechnical masters with a thesis. So, I mean, she absolutely crushed it, right? And, and she had some background stuff to do when she started grad school, but she did it. And now she's working at a consultant firm and she's doing well. So, you know, things are possible. And, and, and it really aligns with, it really comes back to what you're passionate about and what it is that you like. And if you're curious, I think that with engineers, especially engineering consultants, uh, you know, if you're curious, your curiosity can drive you to do that background homework to get up to speed with what you need to have those building blocks to be a good engineer, you know? Absolutely. No. And I, I love that you use that anecdote that kind of highlights that it is okay to make a shift mid career or early career. You do not have to decide when you're 18, that this is your, yeah. this is your degree plan. So this is what you're doing for forever, because I can, pr can pretty much assume every person on this call right now has done some kind of pivot that they did not expect to happen yep. when they were 18 years old. So it's okay to make changes and to go back to school and to decide you want to do something different or even with a slight difference, you, you can make those changes. It's completely okay. <laughs> yeah, Jared, I was curious about you because you were mentioning masters. Uh, for geotech, from your experience and uh, your opinion, do you, how valuable is the geotechnical masters to work in the geotechnical industry? I think it really depends on what it is you want to do. So. You know, if you want to be a consultant, a geotechnical consultant, I, I try not to say mandatory because mandatory is a little off-putting to a lot of folks, but I would say that um, you're going to get to a point where you really need to get that master's in order to continue to climb just because the number of classes you, you, you'll do in a typical undergraduate program, it's, it's it's a small amount, <laughs> you know, when you start to think about what we do, you know, at the grad level, you're, you're getting into, you're getting into seismic design, depending on what program you're in. Um, you're getting into more of the conversation regarding what it takes. It's not just doing a few homework problems. It's like, well, let's just do a prior, just to just take a class on deep foundations. Like we have auger foundations, we have build foundations, we have driven foundation and each one of these you need to analyze it kind of differently right from an uplift standpoint from a compression standpoint from a lateral standpoint you know it, there's a lot that goes into it that you're typically not going to do at the undergraduate level um even when you get into you know earth dams and and you can have a whole semester class on earth dams you can have a whole semester class on supportive excavation design you can have a whole class on on rock mechanics right there's like all these things that if you don't have that master's degree, you oftentimes will be in your career. You, you get to the point where you say, you know what? I feel like I could contribute more to this firm or I could do more from an analysis standpoint if I had more background. And that's where a lot of people will then go back to, to, to grad school. I, I've seen a lot of people do that. If you were taking the route where, um, you know, you like, and again, you can, you can have a great career as a geotechnical engineer in the field, you could be, a, uh, you could be, you could take the route of going with a geotechnical degree. Cause I'm, I'm biased towards uh, consulting. Cause that's what I've done for the last however many years. Right. But like there are people that have a geotechnical background and then they'll go off to work for um, some will work for a developer or some will work for a construction manager. So at that point you understand it, then you're leaning more on like your field experience than your actual, you know, what you're learning at the grad level. But I think that if you're going to be a geotechnical engineer and you're going to be doing any aspect of like design and, um, you know, hardcore analysis, I think you're going to get to the point of your career where you just see a need to go back to, to school. And, and, and I failed to mention that, um, you know, the modeling, if you're going to go into any type of, uh, you know, finite element modeling and things of that sort, you're probably going to want to have a grad level degree. I don't think that, I mean, the undergraduate level, unless you're tied to a research project, you're probably not going to get enough exposure that you feel comfortable um, designing things, you know, or, or doing analysis like that. So I think that you get to a point where you want to do it. And, you know, for me, I just did it straight because I said, if I start working and I, I don't know if I'm going to come back, like I need, just need to get it out of the way. If I have the opportunity, I had the opportunity. So I got my master's and then I started working. And, um, but I know several people that will work for a while and then go back, you go back full time or you'll go back in the evenings, take a class, you know, one class a semester or something like that. 
Uh, so there's a lot of options in, in reality and from a reality standpoint, most firms uh, will provide some type of assistance towards going to school. And I, I always tell people if you're going to grad school, it's always good to have it so that somebody's paying for it, right? A lot of folks will do research and that research will pay for it. Or if they work for a company and the company will pay for it, provided you return to that company for, you know, after you get your degree. So uh, a lot of options there, a lot of options, but I think that um, I think it's important to, and, and I'll, usually um you know, pretty straightforward with that like when somebody asks and they say you know i, I want to work here but i don't have a master's do i need one it's like you know you eventually get to a point where you probably will need one and, and quite frankly you may want one <laughs> you know if you're if you're saying that you don't know how to do certain things it's like you know what maybe i should go back to school yeah i know for me it was more of um in our industry, yeah, it was earthquakes because if you, they don't yeah. teach you seismic in undergrad, so it makes sense to go to master's. So at least in the West Coast where it's really seismically active, it's almost mandatory if you want to work in like a typical design firm. Okay. Um, but yeah, just like your point, that, that's what I say too. It's a, uh, well, you should want to get your master's <laughs> because like, it, right? It shouldn't be, I, I shouldn't have to tell you, go get your master's. You should say, you know what? I'm going to get my master's. I was like, oh, great. Let's work this yeah, out. Yeah, I was right? like. I mean, of course the financial, but in terms of just like your yeah. mindset, you, you would, for me, I wanted to go, I wanted to get to the best school I could get to learn about all seismic. And I think that's how, you know, that's the career that you want to get into. Mm -hmm. um, From my, someone who did not go, go get a master's in an engineering degree. It's okay. If you're also like, that sounds terrible and you do something <laughs> different, <laughs> yeah. you, can, you can still be an engineer living proof. You can nope. still be an engineer and not necessarily get a master's in engineering. If you're going into something as specific as geotech and structural, absolutely. It's going to make you a much better engineer for the long run, but it's okay if you don't do it too. Yeah. No, you're absolutely yeah. right, Alexis. Cause the reality is like, when I think about it, there's so many different, like we say structural engineer, we say geotechnical engineer. There's so many different places within these companies or what should I even say company, but there's so many spaces within the discipline for people with the background. I mean, there are some people that, that, that say, you know, I go into this, I did the calculations, but I don't want to do calcs anymore, but I still want to be an engineer. I want to see things get built. It's like, you could do that. I need somebody to see, right? I need somebody to make sure things are happening or somebody, right? If somebody works for a manufacturer or somebody goes into engineering sales, right? You can have a sales degree, but if you have an engineering background and you go into sales, it's different. So there's so many different things that you can do. There's so many different things. Um, and I think that, you know, somebody says, I want to go to school. There's something for you. You say, I don't want to go to school. Something for you. I want to be in the field. You're here. For you. I don't want to get my boots wet. There's nothing yes. for you, right? So this is absolutely. Good. There is a niche for everyone in the industry. There is someone who, there is a role out there for you. I love that. Yeah. yeah. And with engineering, I mean, you can't go wrong because you, yeah, you can go into anything. I mean, um, Alexis, you're getting your, your MBA. I mean, and you have that engineering background. It's nice. Wow. You know, it's, uh, <laughs> there's not just that one set path that you there's multiple paths and if you have that engineering mindset that uh problem solving skills you, you can go far uh so yeah. really can't go wrong uh, my question uh jared will, <laughs> that, I, that I, I had uh, listed here as uh can you share with us one secret or tip that you think structural engineers may not know about geotechnical engineering uh, if i share a secret it's not a secret anymore <laughs> we're sharing here <laughs> <laughs> We're sharing here. It's a safe space, just the three of us, right? <laughs> and all the listeners. Uh, I would say that, um, well, here's here's one, right? I find it interesting. So I've been podcasting. This is my the new thing, right? I've been podcasting. And I'm, it's fascinating to me that I hear a lot of people, they're geotechs now. They said they wanted to be an architect or they wanted to be a structural engineer. And then they chose um geotechnical but when i talk to them it's like they still have a great appreciation for structural engineering like they they like when i say appreciate they value your input and i think that a secret is that for whatever reason sometimes we think oh it's the geotechs versus the structural engineers or the consultant versus the contractor or you know it's like it's not like that like people actually want to hear from you so i would say a secret is that you know, when you get a geotech report from your consultant and you're looking at like, I don't really understand this whole friction angle thing. Like, why is this here? Like, wow, why is this 42 in this job is 34 in this job? Like, what? <laughs> I got to plug it into my model and what's the difference, right? You, the secret is your geotechnical engineer probably 
would be fine with you calling and asking that question, right? Um, because sometimes, seeker, right? Sometimes we feel like we write these reports and nobody reads them. Sometimes we do have that feeling and I'm sure it hurts our feelings, right? But like, no, but we want to collaborate. So I would say that um, if there's a secret that I could share, yeah, I would say that um, it's okay to pick up the phone and call somebody. You see something in a report or something you, you, you question, you know, most, and I can't speak for all geotechs, but I can say that, you know, the folks that I run circle with, uh, we would like to hear from you so that we can, you know, the last thing we want is you to take something and just run with it and extrapolate. And same, same way for us. Like if I ask you for a load, you give me the load and I'm like, oh, I think that's right, but well, I'll just run with it. Right. And it's like, cause then we get to the point where we're, we're, we're far away from one another. And we say, well, that's not what I meant. And it's like, well, that's a problem, right? Because we've got a 70% CD set going out on Thursday, it's Tuesday. Right. So I think that, um, and I guess I keep coming back to collaboration and conversations and it, it's just so important, so important for what it is we do. I, I like that. I think I'm also going to add just a slight twist for our audience members who especially might be younger. Um, a lot of people believe that engineers are very smart people and then they know a lot. And that is very true. But just because you know a lot doesn't mean you know everything. And it's okay to not know what something means in a report. And it is, I think the personal sign of a strong engineer is to have that humility and curiosity and the ability to raise your hand or pick up the phone and call the person who is the expert and say, I have no idea what this is, or it's been 10 years since I've touched this. Please help me <laughs> understand and contextualize this information because especially in design, when people's lives are at stake and we're, we're, we're responsible for the, the, the users of the end product, um, and their safety, it is critical that we have the openness to say, I don't know, I'm gonna ask the person who does and make that outreach so that you then can use that information in the appropriate way and make the right design decisions. It's so true. And the reality is that we're all, you know, when you think about it, we're all growing up together. I think about people that, you know, I sit, well, now it's virtual, but I'll say I sit in meetings with now and it's like, I remember when we were in the field together, you know, just like, you know, it's like, my feet are wet. Your feet are wet too? Yeah. This is <laughs> like, what happened, right? You know, but it's like, but this is, this is how you learn what it is you're doing. And then, you know, you, you, some people move from firm to firm and some people move to different aspects of, you know, we'll say built environment because that's kind of what the focus is here. Um, but now somebody's, you know, working for the building department, somebody else works for or, you know, a developer, somebody works for manufacturer. Now you have these people you can call upon and you say, hey, remember those days, but you still have questions. We still have questions. We still, we get on the phone now, not to just say, hey, how you doing? It's like, I have a question. I see this and what do you think? So, you know, Alexis, you're right. It's just so important to be humble. If we don't know something, say something. Don't assume that something is something, right? That's how we get in trouble. We don't want to get in trouble. Yes, this is not the field to get in trouble for sure. No. No. <laughs> Awesome. All right. Yeah. I have one final question for you. Sure. And this is kind of building off what we're talking about, but also circling back to your, your earlier statement that, you know, that two different parties, the, the SE and the geotech, they need to understand what each other needs to be successful. Right. So my question to you is what is it that a geotech needs from a structural engineer and how can structural engineers be better teammates with their geotech? I think that um, if we're able to, and every project's going to be different based on, you know, the owner structure and all those things. But if we have a, an opportunity to have an open line of communication, I think that that's so crucial. So if I'm putting together a soil exploration program, we're saying we're going to drill borings here, we're going to do comb penetrator tests here, we're going to do test pits here, but I don't have any input from the structural engineer, I have to make assumptions. Now, if there is a structure engineer on board and I'm allowed to talk to her or talk to him and kind of make sure I understand, not just in the whole structural system, but just the big things, right? It's gonna be a wide open space uh, that's gonna be column free and we're gonna have bearing walls that are gonna take substantial amount of load. Like if I know that ahead of time, I'm putting borings underneath those walls so that we can have a better understanding of what type of uh, load carrying capacity, uh, load carrying capabilities we have at those locations. But if I don't know that information, I just have to use my best guess based on the layouts that I have, the napkin sketches that I have. So I would say that, you know, if we're able to have those conversations early on, that's helpful. Uh, oftentimes I've seen projects where, um, 
you know, the, the client is asking for the structure engineer to do certain things and the structure engineer says, wait, 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 wait. Who's the geotech for the project? Oh, we don't have a geotech. We're going to bring a geotech in during DD or CD. And a lot of times good structurals will say, no, 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 no. You need a geotech now so that we can, you know, get to the bottom of this. I can remember being brought into a project once and um, they were in CDs. I think they were doing a 30% CD. And when you look at the, uh, you know, the structural foundation plan, it had all these asterisks that were tying back to forthcoming geotechnical report. I was like, wait, so you don't know if you're going to have a shallow foundation or a deep foundation? Like, you, you don't know, and you're pricing this set? Like, what is this set worth? It's not worth anything, right? So I think that, um, you know, and that might sound self-serving for the geotech to say that, but I think that um, raise your hand and say something. I think, it's, I think, it's, I think that's a good thing to do. Um, it's the same thing I do. Like, I'm on a project, and I'm like, you know, what are the loads? Well, we don't have loads. Like, well, who's your structure engineer? Like, you need to have a structure engineer so I can provide you a report that's going to be worthwhile for somebody. So, um, yeah, again, the communication is just important. If we're able to call you and we see something that we don't, uh, that we don't follow, I think that vice versa, if that's able to happen, I think that um, that will make both of our lives much easier. And again, it's better for the project, better for the team, you know? Well, I would say, I, I don't think it's self-serving at all. I think for every asterisk you mentioned on that plan set, that's a chunk of money that the owner ends up paying later because we made assumptions yeah. that were false or completely fabricated from nothing. So it's important to have those experts that do have a big impact on the project in early to help facilitate some of those early design decisions. Yes. yes. Yeah. Especially since foundations are definitely one of the more they could be one of the more expensive things on projects, especially if you go with deep foundations. And that's something yeah, that you, you need to know. <laughs> well, and Matt's a little bit biased out there in California. <laughs> yeah. Like, uh, yeah, it's, uh, if there's going to be a contingency, it needs to be, there's gotta be on the underground. Cause none of us had to buy on a guy yet. Right. So it's like, oh, goodness. Yeah. And even with the, even not just piles too, but even like the, the fill, the, what do they have to do to reinforce the soil? Because depending on the contractor, maybe a mat slab, depending on how much they have to excavate, I mean, maybe a, a pile foundation might be cheaper, but that's not something that we can, you know, we need to get the whole team on board. Like, hey, you have to excavate this amount if you want to do mat slab or deep foundations cheaper, even though they're typically not, but it's something yeah. that you need to have a conversation about because, um, you know, you'll end up redoing work and uh, everyone needs to be on the same boat and you don't want to redo keep redoing the foundations. You know, and you also want to make sure that, you know, when assumptions are being made by team members that, you know, there's tied back to factual information. So when somebody says, oh, we're going to, we need to raise grades to get blah, 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 whatever it is for maybe to get above flood level. So I want to add 20 feet of fill. Oh, well, you know, there's a geotech in the room going to say, oh, by the way, you're going to need a retaining wall for that. And oh, by the way, you have compressible soil here. So if you add 20 feet of soil, now all of a sudden, you're going to have settlement issues in the short term and the long term. So it's like, these are the kind of things that it's just, it's important that we're talking, you know, it's really important that we're talking. Absolutely. Uh, Jared, my last question, uh, kind of general, but what do you see uh, the, the geotechnical industry in the future? Like, or do you see any trends or what do you think in general about the future of geotechnical engineering? The future. Um, I mean, geotech's interesting, right? Because like we talk about geotech, we say it's a new field, right? We say, oh, last hundred years for all these advancements for geotechnical engineering. But when you go back, I mean, antiquity, right? I mean, the pyramids are literally still standing. So there had to be some geotechnical engineering that, that went into that. But, you know, when we look at what's happening now, you know, there's still a lot that we are learning about geotechnical engineering. There's still a lot that we're learning about uh, how to learn and how to teach. Right. Um, some key examples, I would say that, and this is not inclusive, but not all inclusive, but I know RPI, Rensselaer Polytechnic, uh, um, let's see, Professor uh, Abdoun and uh, Professor Bennett, they're doing this thing where it's almost like they're using video game, like a video game platform to teach students uh, about cone penetrometer testing, about subsurface explorations, and they have to go on these, on these missions and go through this work day, but they're using, it's basically a video game platform. And I think that's pretty cool, right? That's something for the future. Like, what does it look like? Are we still going to use textbooks? So things will be different, right? 
Um, there's also uh, a lot that's going into, um, you know, kind of taking it further, like uh, with AI and, and, and uh, virtual reality. And um, actually it was an article in Geostrata. So Geostrata is for the Geo Institute for American Society of Civil Engineers. They had a whole um, focus on computational geotechnics back in 2019, first quarter. And um, we're just talking about technology and, and, and what does it mean when you go to a site, if you were to go to a site and you could have, a, you know, like an Oculus headset on and you could see what the excavation looks like based on information that we have from uh, ground penetrating radar, uh, borings and test pits and existing utility plans and, you know, laser scans and the point cloud where you overlay all this, you have your headset on and you can see what things are going to look like under the ground, right? Kind of like the bionic eye that we don't really have uh, now. So there's all these different things. I think that the way we solve problems and the problems that we have, you know, they're becoming a little more complicated and we have to get a little more sophisticated. We think about sea level rise and what does that mean from a geotechnical standpoint? When we think about, um, you know, reducing our carbon footprint and becoming more sustainable and also embodied carbon and what are the recommendations that we're providing for projects? Are they, are they good or bad from a sustainable standpoint? So I think that these are things that, uh, geotechnical engineers are going to have to think about. I know folks are doing research on these things right now. Uh, uh, there was an article actually in Geostrata. Uh, this was last year. There's an article in Geostrata where Professor James Mitchell was talking about uh, what the future looks like and, you know, detailed subsurface characterization and, and what are the, the best methods. Like right now we're using methods that we used 70 years ago, but, you know, 50 to 70 years ago. We can get more sophisticated with that. Um, understanding and quantifying, let's say, time, temperature, depending on engineering properties of geomaterials. Like, again, it's it's soil. So soil changes when it gets very hot, when it gets cold. And these are things that we have to think about. Um, and I think that in order for us to do this the right way, we have to make sure that geotechnical engineers in practice are talking with geotechnical engineers that are uh, doing the research. And we need to make sure that we're, we're, we're thinking about problems that may come about like future events and we're thinking about them ahead of time as opposed to being you know reactive so you're out west right so increased seismic activity like what are we doing to account for that with our design with our construction the ace just had the report card earlier this week we got a c minus right so we're, we're moving on up right <laughs> we're not we want to be we're moving all up so when we think about uh failing infrastructure you know we're reaching the design life for for a lot of structures throughout where we are, right? And, and what does that mean from a geotechnical standpoint? Uh, there are folks that are talking about having smarter uh, cities and smarter installations where you know, maybe you have a retaining wall with, that, that tells you when certain things need to be serviced. Like, how does that work, right? I think these are the things that, you know, I don't wanna say next generation, but the generation now, um, I think these are the things that are being researched. And I think that there's a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of questions that are still being asked. So if those questions are being asked, these are things that need to be researched. Um, saturated soil versus unsaturated soil mechanics and partially saturated soil mechanics. I mean, this is everything I'm saying. It's like, this could be a whole lecture, each one of these items. So I think that there's still a lot to be excited about for the future of geotechnical engineering. And I think it's safe to say that, you know, we're still, we're, we're pretty sophisticated, but we're still getting started with, um, with where we're going as a, uh, as a discipline. And I'm excited to be a part of it. Absolutely. It's a great time to be in civil engineering because as you mentioned, we're kind of hitting that hundred year or that, that lifetime span of, of a lot of the early infrastructure that's been placed. It's coming up on its expiration date and we happen to have a whole new set of technologies that wasn't even fathomable at that time when they were around. And so now we kind of get to puzzle piece together. How do I maintain or fix or redo or, you know, what's the next step to, to making more sustainable infrastructure and how do I utilize all these new tools and toys on the market? It's, it's it's an interesting time to be an engineer for sure. It's exciting. I'm excited. I'm, I can't even stay in my seat just thinking about it. This is cool. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Well, I can hardly stay in my seat. This has been such a fantastic conversation. Jared, thank you so much for stepping away from your own podcast and joining ours. <laughs> thank you so much. Can't wait to turn the tables for you all and have you all on a geotech. Yeah, it'll be, it'll be fun. <laughs> Absolutely. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. We would love to hear your feedback, comments, and or questions. To leave them, please visit structuralengineeringchannel.com. There you'll find a summary of the key points discussed in today's episode, which is episode number 49. 
as well as links to any of the resources, websites, or books mentioned during the episode. Don't forget to subscribe on Apple Podcasts or wherever you tune into your podcasts. Until next time, we wish you the best in all of your structural engineering endeavors.